So prosumers are the new generation of customers that both consume and produce electrical energy. They are a critical component for the new energy landscape, and that is the topic of today, how to enable them, how to promote their participation in the bigger energy landscape. Today with me, I have uh, Tracy Price, CEO of uh, uh, QMerit, and between the two of us, we are going to explore how to, uh, well, support and remove obstacles for this uh, rise of the prosumer to happen. So, we see a future where uh, the industry will operate in a much different way to what we have been used to. Right? The grid has been uh, was invented over a, single, uh, a century ago and has been building up inch by inch based on very specific requirements of the time. Today, uh, with more digital and smart en uh, energy devices, we have the opportunity to reinvent uh, the grid, to have a grid where uh, homes and businesses will both produce and consume energy and connect to the grid in order to transact that energy and flexibility. So, today we have a grid that is unidirectional, right? Uh, generation happening with very large uh, plants that were easy to predict and then go through transmission and distribution to homes and businesses that were only consuming energy. However, in the future, we see this changing. We see uh, prosumers wanting to participate in the, energy, uh, the new energy landscape, wanting to participate in the decarbonization of, uh, of our planet, having an interest of uh, getting more resilience in their installations with still the same level of uh, reliability and affordability of the past that that is uh, escaping us uh, these days. So uh, the good news is that the technology that is uh, required to enable this new energy transition and to have these prosumers interacting with the grid uh, the right way is available today. Right? So in the homes uh, of, of today, you already have electric vehicles and smart inverters and battery storage and smart thermostats, right? An ecosystem of devices and software that allows for uh, homeowners to have much more control, much more independence on uh, their electrical uh, needs. The same happens with uh, commercial and industrial businesses. Right? electrifying more and more of their processes and incorporating microgrids for them to participate in the new energy landscape. Utilities, especially regulated utilities, are having to move into this space also and they are starting to embrace the fact that their customers want something different. They want to be served in a different way and participate. So, if it is not a technology problem, because the technology is available today, and not only in pilots, but technology that is available today at scale, then why are we not uh, uh, seeing the level of acceleration that we were expecting in this uh, prosumer engagement? And the truth is that there are multiple challenges, right? So, before we go into the channel uh, uh, challenges, I would like, uh, everybody has, uh, Smartphone, raise your hands. Okay, we all do, right? Now, how many of you have an app from your utility, your energy provider in the phone? Raise your hand again. Okay, only like a third of the room. How many of you have an app in your phone for one energy smart device? An electric vehicle, a smart thermostat, a battery, Okay, also like a third of you. Now, in my case, I have eight apps. I have one for my sprinkler system that is smart. I have one for my car. I have one for uh, my panel and battery system. I have one for my smart thermostat. I have one for everything. And nothing talks really very well to each other. 
and they do not understand how to operate as a system or how to act with a utility. So even when the, the technology is available today, it's still a little bit disjointed. It's really complex for our uh, prosumers to make the right decisions uh, regarding energy and how to uh, address their future needs and the investments that they need. They are typically not that trustful about their utility because rates have been increasing and this is creating a, a little more of a tension between the consumer of today and the prosumer of the future. And most important, there is a lot of uh, education and advising that needs to happen for uh, these prosumers to really jump into action and, uh, well, make the right decision and get things installed and operating the right way. So, in Schneider, we are working not only on the technologies that are uh, enabling this new energy landscape, but also in ways to remove friction from the system and help you, uh, our prosumers adopt technologies, connect to the grid, and get that uh, more affordable, more reliable, more sustainable uh, and resilient uh, independence uh, and of energy. So with that, I will invite uh, Tracy to come and talk to us a little bit about uh, Qmerit and other solutions we have in the portfolio. Okay. Okay, well, first, thank you, Louis. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it, and uh, thanks for everybody's time today. Uh, Qmerit is the largest uh, provider of electrification bundles, integrations, systems, services, whatever you want to call it. In North America, we have 3,300 locations, 23,000 electricians on the platform, and it is a never-ending battle to try and keep up with changes in technology and be able to deliver that uh, at a high level consistently with, with customer uh, CSATs and NPS that, uh, that's enviable. So uh, we, we do our best to, to do a good job of that. But integrating smart panels, solar panels, battery storage systems, EVs, uh, inverters, it's challenging. Um, the systems themselves are complex, much more complex than, than the average consumer can understand. Uh, and there's no really good source to disseminate that information in a way that makes it simple and coherent and cohesive. So we try and, we try and provide that function. But additionally, the technical labor associated that's required to implement all of these different uh, technologies doesn't exist. So in North America, we've had a, an acute shortage of uh, technical labor for 20 years. Uh, it's been exacerbated by the electrification revolution. Similar issues here in, uh, in, Nor in uh, Europe where people want to buy the most complex product associated with installation and maintenance. So what we're doing is trying to make it easy. We've done a, a reasonably good job of it. And as a result, you can see we, uh, we have a lot of good, night, good brand names up there. Uh, our focus was on fleets and auto OEMs and delivering at scale. So the, the ability to do this concurrent across broad geographies with high quality um, and do it repeatable was important. And that's how we earned the respect of, of these companies. Now, the education uh, element of this can't be overstated. It's a problem. And so we've leveraged technology. We also worked with Microsoft and Schneider's teams uh, to develop an AI tool where a consumer can take a picture of their electrical panel. That picture will immediately be scanned into the AI. Uh, we loaded tens and tens of thousands of panel images into the picture. It'll tell you what the capacity of the panel is, what open loads there are, what existing loads there are. And with one photo, we can give the consumer a pretty good idea as to whether or not they're gonna need load management, if they had an EV, whether they're an opportunity for solar. There's a wealth of information that's captured in this panel photo. And heretofore, the utility does not possess that information. So uh, they don't know what you have in your house. They've got a guess of how much consumption you, you uh, use, but they don't really know what, what uh, existing technologies you have. Um, neither do the car companies, neither do the home automation companies, neither do the cable companies, but they all want a piece of that business. So we invented and deployed for the first time an AI to provide that functionality. Um, we also have a, a, a sister company uh, called Energy Sage 
that is literally the repository of pretty much all of the information in a technical capacity made simple for consumers in the U.S. It's, I think it's uh, 10, 11 million uh, annual uh, viewers that go to the site for education. They have opened up and they have a pilot here in, in France. If you want, you can go out and see it in the uh, technology hub over there. And really the ambition for what we have to do is educate the consumer to the point where they think it's safe to make the next decision. The next decision, the implementation of the technology is really incumbent upon us in, in the workforce. And I will tell you that, that based on the net promoter score that we've been uh, able to enjoy, the most trusted person that that consumer or homeowner can talk to is the technician who just delighted them with one of these technology installs, whether it's a heat pump, EV, solar, whatever. They have earned the trust and the right to have the additional conversation with that consumer. So for us, we try and capture that, that journey along the way. Uh, one of the problems that all of us face, and it's not specific to a locality or a state or a country or Europe or, or Australia or North America, are permitting problems. And I think you've heard this before. The problem that I see with permitting is it's a revenue generator for local cities. And not only are they generating revenue, but they're generating revenue from their most affluent customers today because, let's face it, uh, electrification is not democratized. There are not uh, uh, 10 million EVs that are below $25,000 a piece. So today's early adopter prosumers are people that have the discretionary capital to be able to afford these bundled technologies. It's not really uh, in the interest of the city to try and reduce those people's costs to eliminate the friction. So once you have democratization of electric vehicles, which really is the catalyst for most electrification, I think you'll see fluidity in the permitting processes. Now in Australia, uh, five years ago, they had the same problems that, that uh, we have in North America, and that is it took an interminable amount of time, lots of delays to get this done, the interconnect agreements, very frustrating. And they fast-tracked uh, development, they worked with the government, they worked on different policies and procedures to, uh, to reduce that friction, and in the course of five years, they went from a, a laggard to having ten times the amount of solar per capita of any other country in the world. So it is doable but you have to have government want to do it. Um, as, in terms of interoperable systems, I will echo the sentiment of, um, of Lewis, uh, but I'll add one more layer of complexity, and that is my wife. So I have an app for my HVAC system, an app for the solar. I put in Tesla Powerwalls. I have a Mustang Mach-E. I've got every piece of technology you could get to, to uh, ever want uh, in my home and it was complicated. I did it to myself, I know, I know how complex it is. When I handed my wife the, the apps, uh, she laughed and threw my phone and, and that was it. So until you have interoperability, until you have a single pane of glass, until you go from best of breed, which is where we are today, to best in class, where Schneider's driving everything, you're not gonna get the mass adoption. It's just too hard, too complicated, too frustrating, and, you know, unless you're somebody who really tries to set the mood in your home based on the weather outside, you know, you're not going to get a, a, good, uh, a good outcome there. Um, as far as the, uh, the home energy management system, I, I did mention that um, Schneider is coming out with that in the U.S. I know they've got uh, X-Power, the, the hub coming out here in France. But I can't emphasize enough the need for the fluidity and the elegance of those systems coupled with the education of the contractors that's going to be required. So if you, if you understand right now, these guys are generally installing one measure. They're experts in HVAC, they're experts in solar, they're experts in EVs. They are not uh, bundled systems integrators. And you've got to move an entire electrical labor class into a systems integrator class. Uh, nobody better to do that than Schneider. Obviously, Schneider's been uh, around for a long time doing controls and automation. I was uh, an early Schneider Andover Controls dealer myself, so I, I got uh, firsthand knowledge of the fact that it is doable. But um, it's hard. And I think once you get to the single pane of glass and you make it simple enough that I don't have to ask my kids how it works, we're in good shape. 
So as far as commercial buildings, um, you've heard a lot of the stats already from Peter and others about how much uh, energy is wasted, how much carbon they emit. Uh, the core technologies are not any different than what we do in the residential side. Uh, my background is 30 plus years in commercial and then we moved our commercial focus to residential because there was such a profound need for systems integration to deal with the complexities of the automobile industry. But all of the things that we used to do as bundled energy uh, solutions and systems integration be between solar and geothermal and HVAC and chillers and boilers and air handlers and controls, uh, it's all still there today. And that interoperability issue is big. The, the load management of multiple chargers is a major issue. And one of the things that always puts a smile on my face is the same building engineers that we spent 30 years trying to reduce their demand charges are now having their hair fall out because the building owner is coming in and putting in DC fast chargers and level two, and so the demand charges have gone through the roof. So there's a real balance that has to be struck between what you're doing in fleet and what you're doing in a building. And translating those two languages is not, not always easy. Um, as far as, as a, a great and very elegant solution, microgrids are, are uh, certainly the key. Um, we have several customers who are implementing them, everything from one megawatt to five megawatt and, and beyond. Schneider has put together a couple of different uh, joint ventures, one with alpha structure, one with green structure to target different client sets and, and levels of uh, engagement, but really making microgrids affordable so that you can go to an, a large auto dealership and give them battery storage and solar capability with charging and, and do your, your other systems retrofits and make it viable. So heretofore, again, microgrids, nice concept, a little complex. It's now at the point where I think you can have almost a microgrid in a box and take it out and, and make it effective and implement it. And then uh, as far as proliferation, uh, this, is, this is my favorite topic. So I tell everybody, we are at the moment, the moment. The reason why we founded QMerit was the belief that at some point there was going to be the electrification of everything. When we used to say that in 2016, people said, what's electrification? And so we would explain it and they said, I've never heard that word. And nobody, nobody was using it back then. Now it's, you know, it's up on the stage. But the change to bi-directional technology and the ability to monetize with one of Lewis's company, uh, AutoGrid, and have virtual power plants make the consumer somebody who's a viable prospect to actually pay them for the optionality value of that home storage battery or that car battery is, is it's the watershed moment in the industry. I, I joke around with people that I can see where a utility will start paying a kid right out of college, or not paying, but buy him a new car so that they can have the optionality value on that battery no matter where he drives around. Now that may be three years away, maybe five years away. But there's a world where the optionality value of that battery will pay for most of the installation. Certainly over a five year period of time, you can pay for the upfront installation, the warranty coverage, the maintenance, et cetera. Um, those are the business models that get to be really, really interesting. And, and we're on the cusp of that. Uh, our company does all of the whole home backup charging for Ford. We do all the whole home backup charging for GM. And we do the uh, Cybertruck for Tesla. So we're kind of at the vanguard of the movement. We see what's, what's possible, what's practical, and what works. And I will tell you, it works. And as it becomes um, democratized, and, and it's in every car or every home, not only do you get the value created and dispersed, you also get a much safer, much more secure grid because you're not relying on a power plant centrally to distribute uh, power. Everyone's gonna have a power plant in their home, uh, kind of like uh, early days of Thomas Edison with JP Morgan putting a dynamo in his basement. So he had the first lights in New York City. Everybody's gonna have a power plant in their home uh, one day and, and we look forward to that becoming a reality sooner than later. So with that, I will hand it back to Lewis. Thank you very much, Tracy. So uh, again, this is our reality today and both for homes and for uh, commercial with, uh, yes, with additional investment, but investment that has a very quick uh, payout generally, especially when we are putting into uh, 
in the picture incentives and, uh, that are available now from all sorts of agencies, right? So for the first time in, uh, in our history, all the planets align, right? So saving the planet is not something new, right? It's uh, from the 70s, we have uh, uh, Earth Day. But at the time, only hippies were talking about saving the planet. Now we are all aligned. So prosumers want to participate. Uh, industry wants to offer the right type of equipment and technology to do that. Local governments and cities are putting pledges of uh, net zero uh, at the city level. And then you have federal incentives coming. And most important now, financial institutions are rewarding those that are investing in uh, ESG and new green technologies. So a great example is uh, CityCon. This is one of the major uh, city centers developers in Nordic. And for uh, an, an additional investment of uh, $3 million that had a payback of less than five years, they were able to create the most sustainable, the most energy efficiency uh, city center in, in the world and it has 14% uh, reduction on the average annual energy cost uh, across their different malls. Uh, a huge uh, uh, um, reduction in their carbon footprint and 60% less energy uh, consumed than uh, similar buildings in, their, in, their, in, in Finland. So huge opportunity to decarbonize and to contribute uh, to the planet with a very little uh, additional investment that has a very quick payback, okay? So across the board, Schneider Electric is investing in a lot of different uh, technologies. We are putting our own R&D in different uh, software solutions, in different hardware solutions, uh, in order to promote uh, the, the prosumer, both in residential and commercial. But also we are uh, investing in innovation. So through our energy ventures, arm we are uh, helping startups get off the ground and connect with a, uh, a schneider machine to help them sell and promote their technologies we have portfolio companies like the ones that we have here so um, tracy has talked about uh, energy sage and Qmerit. we also have a consulting and deployment uh, system of, uh, for for private uh, ev charging infrastructure with ev connect and most important, there is an aspect that is related to the grid, right? So uh, AutoGrid and Oplite are focusing on how to integrate the flexibility and the production of these prosumers and aggregate them to create a virtual power plant. A power plant that is created by a lot of small assets and flexibility that when put together can uh, replace the need of a diesel picker plant, right? And create additional services for the energy markets and the utility like we never been able to do before. All powered by digital and artificial intelligence and technology. So if we have the, the technology, uh, then we need to, one, remove friction from the system, but also we need to drive prosumer engagement in a different way. Right? Especially on the utility space, there is a lot of opportunity for our utility customers to really engage with prosumers and help them uh, on their electrification journey. Right? And to make sure that those that with a low and moderate income are not left behind. In uh, North America, but also in Europe, there is a lot of incentives out there uh, available for this journey to happen for this journey to start. But it's interesting that it's not people trying to find money, right? There are so many incentives that now we are helping um, utilities and other agencies how for money to find the people that need uh, those incentives that are willing to make, uh, to take that first step. Only a few years ago, my energy bill from my utility was still just the meter number. Right, I was Mr. 55721XJ. That is no longer the case. Utilities understand that I am a person, that I have a family, that I live in a household 
uh, that has electric vehicles can disaggregate my meter data and create products and rates uh, for me in a very personalized way. And that needs to continue to happen and needs to uh, continue to evolve, right? So we are helping utility uh, customers and other OEMs to help really engage with customers and take them, hold them by the hand through this electrification journey, creating the bundle solutions with hardware, with software, with installation services, with education, for them to actually start in this uh, journey. So, uh, digital is at the center of all of this. So we could not be uh, teaching and uh, uh, engaging and promoting and then aggregating all those assets in virtual power plants without uh, very sophisticated digital tools uh, and artificial intelligence. So data is our uh, new gold. And distributed energy resources and to integrate them through the life cycle of this uh, new energy landscape. So how do we integrate distributed resources on the way that we plan the grid of the future? How we operate the grid of the future? How do we maintain the grid of the future? How do we allow for new, allow for new business models either with a utility but also between individuals is going to, uh, will provide us with the next uh, frontier on, uh, uh, on efficiency and the carbon and sustainability. We have a great experience in North America with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, is a utility in charge of Northern uh, California, uh, specifically the, the city of San Francisco, Silicon Valley and surroundings. And with, uh, with PG&E, we've signed what we call the Lighthouse Agreement. We are now partnering with uh, PG&E to help them uh, adopt technology, either Schneider technology or third-party technology, in a platform uh, framework, right? Best in class, something that will be deployed at scale. There's no time for pilots anymore, right? We are part of an industry that has suffered about pilotitis, right? Instead of uh, taking uh, proven solutions that happen in some other places, we have been trying and trying and trying technology through time. Now it's our opportunity to deploy these solutions at scale and start making a, uh, well, a big dent, become an impact maker. So engagement uh, across the industry and building the ecosystem is key. Schneider Electric alone cannot do it, right? Our utility customers alone cannot do it. We need to really feed an ecosystem of uh, that will uh, work uh, with innovation and uh, with a drive for action in order to make things uh, much better. So with that working together, we are uh, very excited and very confident that we will be facing a more sustainable uh, digital future in the next uh, years to come. So with that, uh, thank you, Tracy, and thank you all of you for uh, your attention today. I think we might have a few minutes for questions or not anymore? Absolutely. Yeah. Some questions? Nope. Yes, please. Hello. Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. I had a question for, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Tracy. From Tracy. Yeah. Um, I've seen that you manage a lot of uh, professional installers. How do you manage to train all those people for these new technologies? This must be quite a challenge. Yeah, we're, we're effectively a university uh, when it comes to that. So we do have a, um, an internal uh, QRC, it's our Q-Merit Resource Center. Every single one of the auto OEMs has given us their information on everything to, to know with the vehicle. All of the EVSC charger manufacturers have given us that information. Um, we have it across the entire spectrum of the different components that we install. And those contractors cannot get a customer opportunity from us until they go through the certification. They have to be certified, they have to be badged. And so we have 127 different programs across 60 different customers. 
and not every contractor is capable of doing all those programs. Some can only do a certain sliver of it, some can do the more robust pieces. And also keep in mind that in the U.S., the early adopter states are what they call the smile states. It's really both coasts and Texas, and so big emphasis on depth and breadth there. But also, uh, we're fortunate that we own 10 of our own locations, so we use those as the R&D lab and as the training center. So we're able to have those across the country. So we do in person, but but the lion's share of it is all in our intranet and uh, an online university. Thank you. Alrighty then. My name is Kim Jonas. Thank you for very inspiring uh, talks here. Uh, personally, I also have a couple of EVs at home, and, and they constitute something like 180 kilowatt uh, hour capacity. The car batteries. Yeah. I was thinking to drive to drive this transition. You talked about have you have you thought about collaborating with the automotive industry? Because when you, when I buy a car, I should be informed of the opportunities to act as a prosumer and, and, and have some easy models uh, presented because it's a kind of eye-opener. And, and it's also driving this virtual power plants, as I can Correct. see. So something that we are doing in the US, uh, we are working with utilities now. So our technology can be deployed in uh, other people's customer journeys. So what we want is to be able to bring the clearing incentives and new rates and new programs from the utility to the dealership desk. So if you are signing a new lease agreement, right there it says, oh, welcome for, uh, congratulations on your new car. I see that you, based on your zip code, you are in this uh, territory. In this territory, the, this utility has a program. Let me enroll you right there and you will get 25 euros less from your lease agreement. And those $25 is uh, what's the benefit from you, but there is some benefit for the OEM that has, provides us with access to their APIs in order to control the device. And there is a lot of value for the grid and the utility. So that value will be shared across OEMs, prosumers, and the grid. Uh, as we incorporate more of those devices into the new energy landscape. So it's very important for us not to uh, think about my customer or your customer. Is the prosumer is our customer. And there is an opportunity for utilities and OEMs to partner to actually provide much better solutions for the prosumers and to find the prosumer wherever they are and at the time that they are making the energy smart decision, right, to really accelerate this transition. Yeah, I think that the biggest problem though, because uh, we have all the auto OEMs as customers, except maybe two globally, um, several of them think they're going to be energy companies. They don't own any coal mines, they don't own any power plants, but GM is GM Energy. Tesla is a power company. So, those companies are kind of setting the standard for, if it's Mercedes or anybody else, they're waiting to see how's this gonna work out. And everybody wants to participate in the uh, value chain, right? Uh, nobody wants to leave any dollars on the table, but it's early innings. They're all trying to figure out what, what the right model is. But I can tell you that certain utilities and certain car companies see each other as competitors, not collaborators. And that is yet to be solved. And we are trying to grease a little bit that uh, situation <laughs> and to help them understand that if you're a car manufacturer, it's not that easy to be a utility. And if you are a utility, you cannot think that you will replace the relationship that that person has with uh, his or her car and the brand that the, the car represents. So that, that's something that that collaboration at the end will have to come uh, uh, some way. Alrighty. All right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.